Ever since I started writing art criticism more than 40 years ago, I've dealt with thousands of images, but I've always been fascinated by one particular artist, a Spaniard, Francisco Goya. This man was one of the most radical artists that ever lived. For years, I'd been trying and failing to write a book about him. And in a weird way that I didn't expect, for how could I, he took me over. About three years ago, I was nearly killed in a car wreck. Six weeks in coma, months in hospital. No white light, no smiling Jesus. Only darkness and hallucination, and the creatures of Goya's imagination, mocking and chattering, the whores and duchesses and witches, corrupt priests, all laughing at me in the certainty that this wrecked Inglés, imprisoned by the ruin of his body, could never reach into their world, Goya's world. But in some way, nearly dying brought me nearer to him. So I hope his people were wrong. I want to think of this film as a journey, a sort of journey into a country that I've never explored enough and yet which has always fascinated me. The name of that country is Goya. And he's a country because he includes so much. He's got such enormous range. There's such a huge diversity of feeling and sensation and type and character in him. For a long time now he's haunted my dreams. For a long time now I've wanted to understand him. To me, he's one of the defining figures of the 19th century because he looks forward into the 20th and he tells us what we have in common with our past and with our ancestors. There are other artists who do this. Beethoven is one of them. Dickens is another. But in the visual arts, in that department, Goya reigns supreme. Here he is in 1792, at the age of 46, painting himself in Madrid. He wears a bullfighter's jacket. It's a declaration. Goya identified the risks of art with those of the corrida. It's a declaration of toughness too, like a painter in the 60s wearing a black leather jacket. I'm hard, I'm with it, and I'm a man of the people. Who were Goya's people? Well, practically everyone in Madrid on the bridge between the 18th and 19th centuries, and you might say practically everyone today. Goya's themes, his subjects are ours, and they're as fresh and modern as if he were working in our own time. He wasn't afraid to look on the world as a dark place where terrible things happen. He knew it was. The images that sprung from his imagination seemed shocking in his time, but even today, to look at many of them is to recoil from their brutality and directness. Goya has always had a very real resonance for modern art. He lies behind Salvador Dali's extraordinary premonition of the Civil War, and this, not Picasso's Guernica, is to me the greatest painting inspired by that disaster. He's like a household god, a keeper of conscience to many artists, including the American painter Leon Golub. This guy was born on the wrong side of the world somehow, okay? And he was clever enough and smart enough and skillful enough, tough enough, that he could play the world's game. So he could do the kind of things that were necessary in order to prove himself. There's something else in him. You see, there's this... What is it? This wildness. There's a wildness in him. It shows in his paintings. He's a rum character, you know. He's all over the place. You can't grab him. You can't grab him. No, because he bites. He's a dog. He, he, that's right. That's right. He bites. It's just that difficulty in pinning Goya down 
that keeps you alive and always fresh. Court painter, satirist, war reporter, with a taste for brutality and refinement in equal measure. He feeds off popular culture, but he isn't simply a man of the people. He's both reporter and moralist. He's weird. He's unpredictable. There are two paintings of the same subject that sum up the huge changes that took place in Goya across his long career. They could be by different artists, light and dark. Here, he was painting a big religious feast day, that of San Isidro. On that day, thousands of citizens in their Sunday best converged on a pilgrimage chapel outside Madrid and had a picnic. It's almost an impressionist scene, the girls in their white parasols, the men in their finery, the sense of social pleasure and jollity, and you feel how much Goya wants to belong to this Madrid. 30 years later, he returned to the same theme with very, very different results. This picture here is called La Romeria a San Isidro, the pilgrimage to San Isidro. And instead of those happy, fashionable, well-dressed young people, you have this horrible snake of beggars and gypsies and dark figures rolling towards the camera like demons crawling across an ash heap. The landscape is dark and miserable. The faces of the people in front as this crowd rises up to meet you, they're the faces of madmen and hysterics. They have a terrible sort of darkness to them. The whole picture is deeply threatening, deeply irrational, profoundly weird. I mean, you would not want to be out in the open with those characters. You fear they might eat you. Now, that's the difference between the Goya who painted the Pradera with all those young Madrilenos that he wanted to know and maybe even wanted to make love to and the Madrid that Goya saw through the filter of his old age and his intense pessimism. Very few artists have ever changed as dramatically as Goya did. And this is part of the enigma of his career that fascinates me, that I want to find out about. We can start the journey by beginning at his beginnings in the village where he was born. Goya wasn't a peasant, nothing like it. He was born in a humble place because his father was working there and his mother was heavily pregnant. They were in Fuente Todos, a tiny place outside Zaragoza, where his mother had a cottage but didn't live. A poor, stony village like thousands of others in Spain, but now an obligatory stop on the Goya pilgrimage trail. Esa casa era la casa de la madre de Goya, no del padre. ¿eh? No, la familia Lucientes, la familia ah. de la madre. ¿eh? Gracia Lucientes es una familia de aquí, del pueblo, mm. a la que le habían construido esta casa pues, a principios del siglo XVIII. Fue una familia bastante grande, ¿no? Se, eran los cinco o seis uh, sí, hermanos. Sí, sí. Ellos tuvieron tres hijos estando en Zaragoza. Sí. Y en el año 1746 fue cuando nació Francisco, que fue el cuarto. ¿Y eso fue la cocina? Sí, esto es la cocina. Sería el lugar donde se hace la vida habitualmente. Aquí en Aragón se les llama sí. también cadieras, si fueran de madera. Pero I've never been here before and it doesn't tell me much. A stone cottage with some furniture that didn't belong to him or his folks. Ah, nice to know that the great man came from somewhere, that he drank water 
ate stew and probably had a cat. Nice, harmless heritage stuff. The fact is that you don't generally learn from places where artists were born, and Fuente Todos is no exception, except that the bare, harsh landscapes around the village do become part of the signature of Goya's later work. What really counted in Goya's upbringing was the city of Zaragoza, the capital of Aragon, where his father worked as a gilder and where he made his first contacts with professional artists, the Bayeux brothers who taught him and their sister, Josefa, whom he later married. Where he got his first jobs as an artist, religious paintings for the enormous church of El Pilar. In the 1770s, he landed a big commission to paint a cycle of murals for a Carthusian monastery 20 kilometers out of town. Now this is interesting stuff. The Carthusians are what's known as a closed contemplative order of monks. They observe silence. Visitors are only rarely allowed into their charter house called the Aula Dei and women are never, ever granted access. Hence, there are very few people in the world who've ever seen the young work of Goya here, and it's never photographed. Gracias. What was the commission? 11 huge paintings telling the story of the life of the Virgin Mary. But once you're inside the chapel, you see at once that most of them are not by Goya, or only partly so. Pero eso no es de Goya, es un res restauración uh, por, por los artistas franceses. Si, si. What happened? Leakage and seepage. Goya, in his inexperience, painted right on the plaster walls with oil paint. Then the rising damp cracked the paint, blackened it, ruined it, and turned Goya's biggest project into a fiasco. So the Carthusians, who really only cared about the religious story, hired a couple of French artists to completely redo the Goyas. It's a weird effect, Goya repainted by a pair of genteel French pre-Raphaelites. Yet they've got a power and a presence that is still recognizably Goyas. The only surviving mural here that is entirely Goya is the scene of the betrothal of the Virgin, which even through its damage still conveys some sense of the big-scale effects the artist was striving for in that large, broad, planar drapery. To me, it's fascinating to see how early Goya became Goya. I mean, here he is, he's very young, he's a kid, and you can just begin to see the lineaments of the mature Goya coming out, certain figures, certain themes, things that he brings in for the first time that tremendous sense of being able to create drama without overdoing it that he had. The looming backgrounds, the shadows, the silhouettes, uh, the alteration of the eye line, all that is already present. It's like, I don't know, it's like hearing the opening notes of a, a symphony. And as he so often would in years to come, as earlier painters he admired in the past had, like Tiepolo, Goya painted himself right into some of the murals. I wish we'd been granted more time here at the Aula Day to really study them, but film crews gub up the work of religious meditation, and much as I'd like more time for contemplation, I'm not so sure about chastity and silence. <laughs> Thank you. 
Goya finished the murals in 1774 and he went to Madrid to join Ramon Bayeu and his brother Francisco Bayeu, who in 1777 was made director of the Royal Tapestry Works. And now a stream of commissions for tapestry designs started coming Goya's way. Thanks to his in-laws, the 29-year-old was on his way at last. And from then on, Madrid would always be the key city for Goya. He lived there, he painted its life, he served its kings for 40 years, he made portraits of just about everyone in it, from ministers to beggars. And by far the majority of his best works of art have stayed there. 130 paintings in one museum alone, the Prado. Hanging a room with tapestries was one of the best ways of decorating it. A whole factory, which is still going today, the Royal Tapestry Works of Santa Barbara, had been set up by Charles III to produce them. Unlike murals, tapestries could be changed, but they had to be woven from designs, and making those designs was Goya's job. In time, he'd find this work a bore. And the tastes of the clientele restricted the range. He was expected to make idylls, happy scenes of modern city and country life, generally as led by the lower classes on which the knobs and nobles could gaze with amused condescension. After the weaving was done, Goya's designs were rolled up and stored. Luckily, this preserved them, and so the paintings, which are so much more interesting and beautiful than their woven replicas, hang in the Prado today. What was he learning from all this cartoon work? How to handle detail, action, expression, pose. All this fed into his later narrative paintings and his portraits as well. And he was learning, most important, about how to please a client, a knack without which no painter in an art world based on patronage had the ghost of a chance of success. One of the things that the royal family really liked was picturesque scenes of combat and fighting between the members of the lower class, you know, a bit like watching a dog fight. And this was one of the best of them. It's called the Fight at the New Inn. Now, Spain was sprinkled with these inns which were scarcely more than sheds. And uh, the idea that it was a new inn, of course, is made ridiculous by the fact that it's so old and broken down. There she is at the entrance, the lady of the house, having hysterics over this barney that's broken out outside. On the right-hand side, there's uh, the origin of it, the card table, with the uh, innkeeper scooping up surreptitiously the cards and the uh, wages that are still lying on the table. And it's been a fight between some new arrivals. One of them's biting another, and they're scrabbling around on the ground, and they're beating the living daylights out of one another. And, you know, this is by implication, of course, not the way the gentlemen settle these matters, but that's part of the point of the picture. These are not gentlemen, they're lower class Spaniards, and that is very diverting for the upper class Spaniards to see on their dining room wall. You have to prove yourself at a certain level in some of these societies, you know, okay? And then you start introducing, not even deliberately, but because this is who you are. Suddenly they're faced with a sort of an expression which uh, a little bit more diabolical. And there you are coming out. The tapestry designs aren't all amusement and light. You can see signs of the darker Goya beginning to show through them. The blind guitarist, for instance. 
Yes, it's the kind of subject that would have been perfectly familiar to admirers of Goya's great forerunner, Velasquez. Painters were always doing dwarves and cripples. But there's something not just pathetic, but strong and imposing about Goya's old blind man. Like so many of Goya's later phantoms, this bony person isn't just going to go away when you toss him a coin, as that gentleman tourist in the yellow coat fishing for his purse is about to do. The big year of promise for Goya was 1788. Charles III died and his son, Charles IV, succeeded him. He and his queen, Maria Luisa of Parma, would reign for nearly two decades. Carlos would make Goya his chief court painter, an accolade that brought him to the peak of material and financial success. Goya would later be stricken down with a terrible illness Spain would be plunged into a nightmare of confusion and war. But how secure this enormous palace in Madrid with its 1,200 rooms must have seemed then. And how impregnable the grandeur of its monarchs whom Goya repeatedly painted. Carlos, the bumbling squire who liked nothing better than hunting and had no mind for political intrigue, Goya painted him in his shooting gear with his retriever, which, notice, has traces of the letters G-O-Y-A on its collar. Maria Luisa, the impetuous Italian princess, no genius, but certainly the most maligned woman in Spain. The story took root and spread that Goya's portraits of this couple were cartoons. Ever since the French writer Théophile Gautier called this portrait of Carlos IV and his family a picture of the corner grocer who has just won the lottery, people have had the idea that in some way Goya was satirizing these subjects of his. Of course, it's complete nonsense. You did not manage to keep a job or make any money as an official court portraitist if you were satirizing the people that you were painting. In fact, every single one of the figures here was the subject of several preliminary studies, which the sitter would then see before. No, no, this is not a send up. This is actually, if anything, an act of flattery. For instance, on the left, in the blue suit, we have one of the most odious little toads in the entire history of Spanish politics, the future King Ferdinand VII, the then Prince of Asturias, who Goya actually manages to almost make quite regal. God knows how he did it, but he did. This is very much an act of homage. It is very much an act of respect, almost verging upon an act of flattery. Night falls in Madrid, and at the Prado, a new Goya show opens, called Goya and His Women. A vast subject, and partly because its patron is the Queen of Spain, the hottest cultural ticket in town. Here you can see the enormous range of Goya's depiction of the opposite sex. From ravishing beauties to wrinkled crones, duchesses, milkmaids, and mahas. And as you go through it, you realize that he missed nothing. Not a detail of costume or makeup or hairdo, not a jewel, not a gesture. He was one of the greatest topographers of femaleness that Europe has ever known, and by far the greatest that Spain has produced. Yet in this immense harem of the eye, one player is missing.
she is in another palace at the far end of its stately rooms, which she hasn't left in 50 years. Goya's relationship to her and hers to him has created more scandal-mongering and sexual gossip than almost any liaison in art history. Maria del Pilar Teresa Cayetana Alvarez de Toledo, the 13th Duchess of Alba, was not, by any stretch of the imagination, an intellectual like some of her friends in Madrid. But she was a wonderful dancer, she was extremely beautiful, and a visiting Frenchman remarked in a book that he wrote on his travels in, in Spain that there was not a hair on her head that failed to excite desire. And she was a fairly hairy girl. Goya painted and drew the Duchess over the years, sometimes in very intimate settings, doing her hair, doing her makeup. The myth has endured for a very long time that Goya and the Duchess had a wild affair, but alas, there is no evidence for it whatsoever. It seems like the purest speculation and fantasy. And although some women love to have a fling with genius, why would so famous a beauty get so involved with a man more than twice her age, I say put it down to friendship. But the point is that Goya may not have thought that way. He must have felt her sexuality with the uncensorable instinct of a hound getting a scent. I think he desired her with the passionate and rather deluded possessiveness that men of his age and mine can feel for much younger women. So he did a portrait of her that he always kept, that never left his house, that she may never even have seen. On her finger are two rings with her name and his. And she is pointing to two words written in the sand at her feet. Solo Goya, only Goya. But it's his fantasy, not hers. That's the sad thing. Goya loved hanging out with the society ladies, but the maho in him was also drawn to the mahas, street girls, feisty and foxy. Out of this came this image, the grandmother, you might say, of Manet's Olympia, sizing you up from her daybed. I wish there was a little bit more pink on the right nipple. It's hardly a surprise that a great deal of fantasy surrounds this picture. The naked Maha, one of the most famous nudes in the world, and actually Spain had almost no tradition of the nude, and Goya was, to a degree, breaking the mould when he made this gorgeous girl. However, it's got absolutely nothing to do with the Duchess of Alba. Everybody thinks it does, but actually, in the year that Goya painted her, the Duchess of Alba herself was 40 years old and beginning to die of the breakbone fever, which eventually took her life away. This is not a portrait of a 40-year-old woman suffering from dengue fever and tuberculosis. Probably, it is a picture of the mistress of the Prime Minister, whose name was Godoy, and who was madly enraptured with this Malagan cutie called Pepita Tudo. This, I am sure, is actually Pepita. I've often thought what my feelings about the subject are. They are, of course, naturally of admiration for the formal qualities of the painting, but in reality, they are of unmodulated lust. What I would really like to do, were it possible, and alas, neither time nor the guards of the Prado would permit it, would be to hop in there like a bee getting into a peony and have a wonderful afternoon.
At first, Goya was very happy in Madrid. He had lots of work and for top people. Rolling in cash for the first time, he boasted to his boyhood friend from Zaragoza, Martin Zapater, he's making 15,000 reales a year as court painter. He's got a beautiful brand new English carriage that will turn on a dime. He's the envy of the town. And then it all went horribly wrong. Late in 1792, he was staying with a friend in Andalusia named Sebastian Martinia. And he had a sudden attack of illness. Vertigo, nausea, blindness, noises in the head, deafness. In time, some of the symptoms abated, but the deafness, no. For the rest of his life, Goya was stone deaf. It was a catastrophe. I can stand on my own feet, he wrote to Zapater, but I don't know if my head is on my shoulders. I have no appetite or desire to do anything at all. I don't know what will become of me. What did deafness mean for Goya? Well, it wasn't a simple answer. On the one hand, it imprisoned him. It put him right in the dungeon of the self from which he could not communicate with people outside. No more conversation, no more jokes. On the other hand, it liberated something in him. It turned him away from being the court portraitist, the court painter that he otherwise might have remained, into this amazing topographer of the inner self, of everything that had to do with hallucination and madness, craziness and fear. He recovers again life, but something has changed inside. Mm, he always wanted to be free. And he says that in his letters, right? Free from what? Free from working to all these ladies that he had to work for, for example. Or some of them he clearly yeah, enjoyed. Yeah, he liked and enjoyed, but, but, you know, he says that in his letters, right? He only paints for the high aristocracy and nothing else, or for his friends. And that's what he wants. He wants campicos y buena vida. That means my field, my, my field, my property, my in the fields, field. and buena vida, and a, a good, good life. life. Yes. That's what he wants. And for that, he was trying to get it, you know, with his money, with his shares in the Bank of, Bank of Spain. He was trying to get that. And when he's ill, uh, it's a starting point for that, you know. He begins to do his paintings without commission, to sell them freely, his, his drawings to make prints, to make money. <coughs> Mm? Yep. and to express, express his, uh, his own ideas. And, you know, he is a new man, a modern mm. painter, a modern artist. Some of the work Goya did just after he went deaf hangs in the Royal Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, and to go there today is like walking into a microwave. It's so intense. If there's one point where the modern temper in art is born, it's surely these Goyas of the 1790s, whose violence and irrationality seems to match the catastrophic social upheavals of the time. The work was small, cabinet pictures, he called it. It was private, and almost all about disasters and bad places. The idyllic world of the cartoons might never have existed. Instead, you have religious craziness, orgiastic ceremonies, dark pageants based on folklore, like this vision of sinister masks and banners, the burial of the sardine. If there's anything Goya did, is he was facing his own demons, you know? If an artist faces that, 
then it's going to come through. So I think that there were things moving through him, forces moving through him that were in a sense, almost ripping him apart. Through his art, he controlled them. He made it work. If he hadn't had his art, he would have been ended up in an asylum. Prisons, madhouses. These, too, were the shapes of his own fears. Madhouses in the 18th century weren't reformatories. They offered no treatment, no cure. They were just dumps, holes in the social surface, charters for degradation. Goya knew this well. In the 1760s, his aunt and uncle had been shut up in the asylum at Zaragoza. Maybe he feared madness was in his blood? He painted one madhouse scene which is deliberately a satire on the world of power and order. The world upside down, madmen dressed as kings. Gestures of power and chivalry with no meaning. Even inverted sex in the form of one man fellating another in the corner. But for Goya, the most powerful of all images of an inverted world was witchcraft. Who believes in the power of witches today? Practically no one. Who did in Spain in the late 18th century? Practically everyone. Did Goya believe in them? Well, yes and no. Nominally, he was a skeptic. But his deepest feelings were always engaged by the old black Spain. Not of Frenchified Madrid, but of deep Aragon. This one, Witches in the Air, is for me the best of all his witch pictures. A traveler on a lonely road has been swept up into the sky by three male witches. Their bodies are compact and muscular. They defy gravity. They're gobbling like owls at the flesh of their prey. It's horrible and totally real, almost mundane, which is part of Goya's point, just part of the world. It was believed that witches stole the lives of babies as a sacrifice to bigger witches or to the devil himself. Today, this makes no sense, but it made more sense in a time of huge infant mortality, like Goya's time. Goya's own wife may have been pregnant 20 times, but only one son made it through to adulthood. It was very easy to believe that evil beings were stealing your children. And even if you didn't believe in that, you could still get an enjoyable thrill out of the witch cult, the way you and I might enjoy a Dracula movie, though we don't believe in vampires. And this is probably why pictures of witchcraft account for about one in every four plates of his satirical series on Spanish life, The Caprichos, Goya's first great graphic masterpiece, and a milestone both in the history of satire and in the development of fine etching technique. In February 1799, Goya paid for a newspaper ad in the Diario de Madrid, which announced its publication. The author, he declared, quote, has selected from among the innumerable foibles and follies to be found in any civilized society and from the common prejudices and deceitful practices which custom, ignorance, or self-interest have made usual, those subjects which he feels to be suitable material for satire 
and which at the same time stimulate the artist's imagination. About 20 of the plates refer to witchcraft. Some 25 are about sex and marriage, seduction, prostitution, kidnapping, rape, and in general, the miseries of love. He gets at monks and priests, the inquisition, the wiles of quacks and doctors, the pretensions and follies of aristocrats. It's a pretty complete indictment. He doesn't believe that women are good and faithful, or that men are decent and honorable, or that those in power deserve to be. All three he treats as fantasies. He won't accept the familiar scheme of goodies and baddies because to him, all Madrid society is linked to a series of agreements or, to put it bluntly, deals. I grab from you, you grab from me, each of us loses and each gets something. These were risky things for a court painter of all people to be saying, and the series was a giant commercial flop. Only 27 sets out of the original 300 sold. The public Goya hoped for, that he wanted to create, that he wanted to find, just didn't get it. Well, you know, I've had a lot of success, okay? Of all kinds. At the same time, I have felt I don't, uh, that a lot of my work has not been seen. It's been seen, but it's not been seen. In other words, there's a certain kind of avoidance within the art world itself at certain levels to see it. And that's because of its kind of political or aggressive or whatever the hell, you know, we're talking about, mm -hmm. attitude. And I think it's not just true of me, it's true of a fair number of artists. Do you, you think see? it's true oh, of Goya? Oh, yep, yep. The only way society protects itself finally is by not seeing them. Then when the artist has departed and the situation's over, then they can say, ah, yes, we understand you. you what see? a master. What? What yeah, a master. Yeah. Oh. And then it, it partly moves, it's partly recognized politically, but it's sort of aestheticized after 25, 30, 50 years and so on. Because it's aestheticized, it permits the, the general public to f look at it with less uh, uh, squeamishness, you see. But if it's right in their face, they don't like to look at it. In a way, Goya was following an English pattern when he did the caprichos, which means caprices in Spanish. England had a solid tradition of really savage political and social satire, and it was protected by law. Hogarth, Gilray, Rowlandson. Goya admired them all, but there was no one like them in Spain, which meant that in their own culture, the caprichos were surprisingly innovative even though the lack of legal protection forced Goya to be very careful about political figures, none of whom are named. Of all the hundreds of prints that Goya did, this one, The Dream of Reason Brings Forth Monsters, is probably the most famous. It is Goya's summing up of his belief in the supremacy of reason, but the weakness of that supremacy. I can't imagine Goya without the caprichos. He wouldn't be Goya. To me, they're a daily talisman. I've never been a collector, and that, of course, is partly because I couldn't possibly afford the things that I like best. However, I really don't think that critics ought to collect anyway. 
But there are exceptions to every rule, and I don't see anything wrong with having a few prints by somebody that you admire, and I'm certainly not going to give up my Goyers, of which I have maybe a dozen, bought back in the 60s for 30 quid each, and treasured by me ever since, not really as objects of investment, because I'm never going to sell them, but as little windows into an artist I revere. You walk in the door and you catch something out of the corner of your eye that you hadn't seen before. It's a kind of intimacy that's worth having. It's like a conversation that gets taken up at odd times when you least expect it. I mean, I love my caprichos. I'm never going to let them go. They tell me something about a man whom I really want to know and probably in the end never will know well enough. Goya was certainly no atheist. He despised superstition, he hated priestly corruption, but he was very much on the side of faith. I don't think that he could have brought off his last great church commission otherwise. The decoration of the dome and vaults of a small church in Madrid, San Antonio de la Florida. The story that Goya has to tell in this church wasn't new. It went back to the 13th century, and it probably wasn't true. But my God, is it well told. It concerns St. Anthony of Padua, a Franciscan monk in Italy, who one day received the news that his father, who was living in Portugal, had murdered a man. Now, naturally, St. Anthony didn't believe this, and so he flew miraculously to Lisbon, where he was able to raise the corpse from the dead. And the corpse spoke and had said, no, it wasn't your father, it was that guy over there. The saint's father was released and Goya had the opportunity of a lifetime several hundred years later to paint this extraordinary crowd of people all reacting or in some cases not reacting to a miracle and creating what was in effect a terrific panorama of street life on a paseo of Madrid high in the sky. A vast theatre of emotion is in this dome, wonder, doubt, gaping curiosity, dumb piety. These faces are real, lived in, not polished and idealized. This is not late Rococo religious froth. It plainly affirms Goya's interest and faith in plain people. Charles Dickens would have loved it. By 1808, the external politics of Spain had become dreadfully complicated. Napoleon managed to smuggle a whole army into Spain to trick Charles IV and his queen and their son Ferdinand into going to France, where they were promptly interned. Then Napoleon put his own brother Joseph on the throne in Madrid, backed by a French army. The people of Madrid rebelled. With knives, clubs, and their teeth, they attacked a force of Napoleon's Egyptian mercenaries on the Puerta del Sol, the main square of Madrid, on the 2nd of May, 1808. And the next day, Napoleon's army rounded up everyone who looked like an insurgent and shot them without trial. Thus, the 2nd and the 3rd of May became dates of tremendous symbolic importance the rebirth of Spanish identity, the start of a great war of national liberation that the Spanish would win against all the odds, against the greatest war machine in Europe. And Goya became the tragic poet of this process, the first great war reporter in art. He set to work on a monumental series of etchings entitled Fatal Consequences of the Bloody War Against Bonaparte in Spain with Other Emphatic Caprices. It's known for short as the Disasters of War. He was 62 now, much too old for a war correspondent, a breed of journalist that in any case didn't exist yet, and too deaf even to hear a gunshot. Yolo vi, I saw this, 
he inscribed underneath one plate of refugees fleeing from a village. But perhaps he didn't see it. Some of the atrocities he drew, the executions, the dismemberings, the rapes, he could not have seen and got away from alive. He wanted the fiction of being an eyewitness. And so he created a wholly new form, that of vivid, camera can't lie pictorial journalism long before the invention of the camera. Art is an act of witnessing, drawing its power as propaganda from its immediacy. Art is a lie in the service of truth, the illusion of being there when dreadful things, unimaginable things, happen to ordinary people. I was researching Goya's prices the other day, and one of the things that really amazed me, the cheapest prints of all, believe it or not, are the disasters of war. Even now. Even now. And because they're the, they're the ones that and people... And they're the greatest. And they're the greatest. Nobody wants, except a few maniacs, nobody wants to look at ugly things, okay? We recognize that our lives are relatively short. We want to have pleasure, okay? We want to have some orgasms here and there, you see? We want to enjoy some landscapes, okay? We want to uh, enjoy automobiles and the whole business, okay? Why the hell do I have to look at this junk for? Do you enjoy looking at Goya? Yes, sure. Do you enjoy looking at the disasters of war, at the black paintings? Absolutely, and I think they're beautiful. But Goya fools you into believing that he's just saying how it was. That's why the disasters can still bring tears to your eyes and mine. In war, ineloquence is best. Photography has made us used to every kind of disaster, even to catastrophes like September 11, 2001, which produced hundreds of thousands of images, amateur and professional, a colossal mosaic. In Goya's time, any record of witness was rare and witnessing on this scale was simply impossible. Only later do you realize how constructed the disasters are. I think this was why Goya is still the god, the father figure of every war photographer I've known. He could stare right down the beast's throat and not look away. Goya never made a cent from the disasters. They weren't even printed until 1863, decades after his death. And from the beginning of the war to the end, he never drew any money from the salary due him as chief court painter. So he needed a big commission when the war was won, and he asked to be allowed to paint those symbolic moments of national glory from 1808, the attack on the Mamelukes, or the 2nd of May for short, and the execution of the Patriots or the 3rd of May, both of which he finished in 1814. The 2nd of May is a confused melee. It's almost chaotic, this record of men in the throes of anger and fear, stabbing and hacking at one another. Look at that boy on the right, afraid to stab, afraid not to stab. See, what's interesting to me about a lot of his paintings as you look at them, is that there is a solidity to them. They're so physically tangible. So they're right in this world, you know? They're screaming out that they're right in this world. They're physical, they're tactile, extremely tactile. And it's painted in, often in a very succinct way, and it's extremely brusque. You see a head and you realize, oh, it's 
just a, you can see the skull inside the head. You see? I mean, the structure is there. To me, the greater of the two paintings is the 3rd of May, where the suspected rebels are being lined up and shot by the French firing squads. Goya was in Madrid at the time. Did he see the killings? We don't know, but probably not. But the power with which he imagined them, you can't get that out of your mind. It has such a grand, tragic kind of construction to the whole thing that there's really nothing like it. I mean, it's very simple, and yet at the same time, it has tremendous resonance. The French firing squad, for instance, those anonymous backs leaning forward into the recoil of those big 70 caliber muskets, but you don't register them as people, whereas there's this intense humanity on every face of their victims and then it all reaches a climax in that little Christ of the people in his white shirt, blazing with light, blazing with defiance, and throwing out his arms in this one last assertion of the primacy of life over death. And, you know, you just can't look at it without the impulse to weep. The extraordinary thing, I think, about the way that he paints the dead in this picture is that the blood is paint, but the paint has that kind of scrabbly, scratchy, half-dried quality that looks as though it actually is blood, as though the application of that pigment to the surface was done by the twitching hands of men who were dying, you know, and whose hands had already been dabbled in the blood. It has this very, very pressing reality. It's, it doesn't try to be beautiful, it tries to be true. I think it's one of the great pictures of all time by anybody. It is no longer true that bullfighting is the national sport of Spain. Soccer is. But in Goya's day, the ritual of the bullring was absolutely central to Spanish identity. And today, I don't care what the self-appointed humanitarians think about it, I want to see fox hunting preserved and bullfighting even more. When one contempla the lámines, the gravados of Goya, the tauromachia, sin duda se retrotrae a una época del toreo que está fielmente reflejada en, en unas fotografías magníficas, porque realmente lo que hace Goya es retratar una tauromaquia. Goya is everywhere in Spain, still, a national passion. Whole fiestas and bullfights, like this one in Ronda, the spiritual heart of Spanish bullfighting, are dedicated to him. Goya is the kind of person, the kind of artist that everybody likes in Spain. Everybody feels very close to him. They get him they, in, into themselves. I mean, it's like an unconscious thing. His images, his life, his everything. He was very popular at his time. They recognized him in the streets, and he couldn't go out easily because they said, Goya, Goya. Hola, Don so, Francisco. Hola, Don Francisco, yes. Goya returned to bullfighting often, right through his painting career. It was part of the old Spain that fed his imagination. In this, he was set against good liberal opinion. The Ilustrados, the enlightened liberals, wanted bullfighting banned, and indeed it was banned for a while by Charles IV. But you might as well have tried to ban baseball in America by an act of Congress. Some things are just not culturally feasible. Francisco de Goya, I think, has been for the tauromachia the first great notario graphic, the first great chronist, the first one who has been able to see, value, and then plasm the risk in a spectacle that was really something incipient. 
pero que amaba ese espectáculo, que lo entendía perfectamente. Yo creo que si a Goya hay que ponerle algún pero, quizá fuera que no se atreviera a torear. Y Goya lo que hace es expresar su sentimiento, lo que él siente. Y él siente una pasión por ese espectáculo. Porque, repito, que él es torero en el fondo. En 1816, cuando Goya se out en sus grandes etchings de la arena, la Tauromaquia, España had just won the war against the French. And I can't help seeing Goya's series as his affirmation of his country. It's 33 plates, a partly a history of the ritual, but it's a fanciful history. Starting with primitive Iberians hunting the bull, emerging as the modern corrida with its passes and suertes and star toreadors, some of whom Goya knew personally. In describing all this, he vented his obsessions. He also recorded some of the tabloid sensations of the bull ring, such as the moment when a bull jumped into the front rows of the Madrid arena and gored to death a VIP, the mayor of Torrejón, an image of almost incredible modernity and power, with the frantic scattering figures on the right played off against the void, the empty space on the left. Technically, the bullfights are brilliant etchings. Their use of two personages, light and dark, sun and shadow, gives them a tremendous narrative grip. And no images of bullfighting have approached them since, not even, or especially not, Picasso's. He was into his 70s now. His glory days at court were over. The restored king, that hulking absolutist toad, Ferdinand VII, he didn't like him much, and the feeling was mutual. Most of his friends were dead. His wife, of whom we know nothing, had died in 1812, though his only son, Javier, was alive. He was still preyed on by illness. It wouldn't let him go. And in 1820, the year he turned 74, it left an unforgettable painting, Goya's self-portrait with his friend and physician, Dr. Arieta, one of the most beautiful testaments of skill, compassion, and caring friendship ever painted, a long way from the harsh satire on quacks in the Caprichos. Not so many artists can surprise you at that age. We dream of a great late style, but few achieve it. But like Titian, Goya actually did. He reached deep into himself and pulled out something grand and frightening and unexpected. Goya had bought a farmhouse across the river from Madrid. It was called the Quinta del Sordo, the deaf man's house. Not actually after Goya, but after its previous owner, a farmer who was also stone deaf. He was solitary, and he began to populate the walls of the deaf man's house with the phantoms of his imagination. From a modern perspective, these pictures, which even now we can scarcely understand, are the climax of his long career. They got called the black paintings simply because they're so dark, dark in color, dark in meaning. He painted them directly on the plaster in oils, which has made them a nightmare for conservators ever since. They might have been destroyed altogether because after Goya's death, 
The farmhouse was demolished, but by blessed luck, the place had been bought by a French property speculator who arranged to have the murals detached from the walls and remounted on canvas, which is how we see them today all together in the Prado. They don't make up a coherent narrative. There are scenes of witch covens, scenes of pilgrimage. There are hideously vital old crones slurping up their soup. There are biblical figures such as Judith killing King Holofernes, but absolutely no references to Jesus or to God. There is a terrifying reprise of his old theme of the pilgrimage of San Isidro, but now they're chanting or howling. They're making some kind of semi-animal noise anyway, but they can't be heard. They're the creatures of Goya's own deafness imprisoned on the other side of the glass. He's a man at the end of his rope, and yet he's painting it explicitly. He couldn't have continued painting if he didn't start to let these monsters come out. No, because he would have been involved in some sort of an act of self-censorship. Absolutely. And he never censored himself as far as we know. Absolutely. He? Well, there wasn't much left to censor. <laughs> Saturn, the god of melancholy and, not incidentally, the patron god of artists, eating one of his own children, as in the Greek myth. Is there another face anywhere in European art more freighted with hunger and despair, with the horror of self-awareness? The Greek fates hovering in the air, measuring and snipping the thread of human life. And that famous dog peering over a ledge, or perhaps trying to raise its head above the quicksand in which it's drowning. Goya saw more pathos in that dog than Rubens could get into a whole crucifixion. He's mad at the world, but he's also mad within himself. But he's crazy like an artist, he's not crazy like a madman. He's crazy like a genius. Mm. He's, he's, he's absolutely, you know, he's absolutely in control. He's out of control and he's in control. I mean, we can't separate the two with him. It's, it's like this. That's his power. Goya was no more mad than Shakespeare was when he wrote the mad scenes for Ophelia or King Lear. Furious and inspired, yes, but infused with an icy control. And it's the combination of the fury and the control that announces the genius. I tell you, I admire him so much, but he also frightens me so much sometimes, because the thing about Goya is his absolute authenticity. You feel that the demons that inhabit his work come absolutely out of the center of his being. They're completely familiar to him. It's like he, he has breakfast with them. They are what we are, and he shows this with complete lack of any sort of embarrassment or pretense, you know when you look at the black paintings that there go I. The two men sunk up 
to their waists in the bog, belting at each other with sticks. Could be North and South Ireland, they could be Bosnia, Kosovo, they could be Talibans and Americans, they could be just about any insoluble conflict between human beings which is brought about by the madness of religion and property. And that's why these are so powerful. They don't propagandize, but they leave you with no choice but to, to empathize with them and to realize that it could be you, it could be me, and it probably is. In the end, he couldn't bear the Spain of Ferdinand anymore. In 1824, aged 78, he asked his monarch for leave to go to a French spa to take the curative waters. He got permission, but he wasn't going to come back. Finally, this quintessential Spaniard was an exile. He settled in Bordeaux, where his old friend, the writer Moratin, also in exile, reported that, quote, Goya has indeed arrived old, clumsy and weak, without a word of French, and so happy and so anxious to try everything. He ate with us just as though he were a student. And he kept drawing and drawing and drawing. One of his sketches sums it up, I think, an old man on sticks, hobbling along, forging ahead against his infirmity. He's staring us straight in the face, and over him is written in Goya's by now rather shaky hand, Aún aprendo, I'm still learning. He died on April 16, 1828. He was 82 years old. He was buried in Bordeaux. In 1901, his remains were dug up and brought back to Spain. In 1929, they were moved and buried again, this time in the church that he had frescoed in Madrid. San Antonio de la Florida. Now he lies under the beautiful girl angels he had painted there. Well, nearly all of him does. When Goya was moved back from France, someone stole his head. It has never been found. One hopes it is somewhere in Spain. This is the bit where one's supposed to sum Goya up, wrap him up neatly, draw a line around him and his achievement. Well, I can't do it. Goya doesn't respond to such approaches any more than other big figures of his century do. There is no plausible way to put Beethoven in a capsule or to say what the essence of Dickens was. Goya was one of those uncommon artists who had the daring or the folly to take on the whole scale of human fate. It was a huge scale, and nobody works on it today, because our sense of the possibility of art, what it can do, what it can say, and why it can matter, is so depleted. But it never occurred to Goya that art might not be able to say anything and everything about our nature, our desires, and our fears. He just assumed that it could, and he went ahead. And by assuming it, he left us with the difficult task of living up to his peculiar intensity. And if we can't, as is likely, at least he shows us that. Nearly 200 years after he died, to meet Goya is still to meet ourselves. <laughs>